2006 was a huge year in pop culture. In the world of film, Martin Scorsese brought us The Departed. In music, Gnarls Barkley was topping the charts with their hit single Crazy, and meanwhile in the world of wrestling, the ruthless aggression era would continue, with John Cena at the top of the card, all while at the same time, a new rated R main eventer was about to make his presence felt too. But how did it all happen? Well, join us today as we take a deep dive into the entire story from start to finish in the WWE in 2006, A Year in Review. And this one would start with a bang, because at the first show of the year on January 8th, New Year's Revolution, after a mostly forgettable card which saw Triple H defeat the Big Show and Trish Stratus get the better of Mickie James, the main event would feature the return of the Elimination Chamber. Of course, this would put WWE Champion John Cena at a distinct disadvantage then, because here he'd have to defend his title against five other men, with those challengers being made up of Shawn Michaels, Kurt Angle, Kane, Carlito, and Chris Masters. That said, by the end of the bout, he'd have come out on top. The only problem with this was that, while he was laying there beaten and bloodied in the ring, Vince McMahon would come out to announce that right then, Edge was cashing in his Money in the Bank contract and was challenging the champ one-on-one. -on -one. So with Big Match John barely able to stand at this point, what happened next was inevitable. And after just one minute and 46 seconds then, this would come to pass as the ultimate opportunist celebrated in the ring with Lita as the new WWE Champion. But this wasn't the only big world title change going on at this point, because meanwhile over on SmackDown, a tricep injury would see Batista have to vacate his championship. And this meant that on the January 13th episode of SmackDown, a 20-man battle royal would take place in order to crown a new top dog on the blue brand, with the winner of this ultimately being Kurt Angle. So this led us into the next big show of the year then, the Royal Rumble on January 29th, as there, while Angle was defending his newly won belt against Mark Henry, John Cena would get his rematch with Edge. But while Angle would successfully defend his gold, in that latter bout, another title change would actually take place, as after tapping out the rated R superstar in just over 15 minutes, Cena would once again be the champ. Elsewhere on the card, meanwhile, Gregory Helms would win the Cruiserweight title from Kid Cash, Mickey James would score a victory over Ashley Massaro, and in the Rumble itself, Rey Mysterio would do it for Eddie Guerrero when, after drawing the short straw and entering at number two, he'd go the distance and win the entire thing. So this then meant he'd be the number one contender for either the WWE title or the World Heavyweight title at WrestleMania, a decision he'd have to think long and hard about over the weeks which followed. And when he eventually settled on challenging Kurt Angle, it meant a new challenger would have to be determined for Big Match John at the Showcase of the Immortals too. So in order to find one then, an eight-man tournament would be held over on the red brand over the next few weeks, with the winner of this ending up being Triple H. Meanwhile though, as Raw was doing this, SmackDown would be returning to pay-per-view on February 19th, as it was then that they would host No Way Out. And this show would be a pretty eventful one as it happened because not only did it feature another entry in the ongoing Best of Seven series between Booker T and Chris Benoit, but it would also see Kurt Angle defend the World Heavyweight title against The Undertaker. Of course, proving he really was as good as he said he was here, the Olympic hero would be able to score a pinfall over the dead man during this one, ensuring he'd be walking into the biggest show of the year as the champion. That said, his challenger would be less clear after the night was over, because elsewhere on the card, Randy Orton would challenge Rey Mysterio for his WrestleMania title shot, with the Legend Killer actually managing to get the win here, and seemingly freezing Rey out of the title scene at the last minute. Luckily then, as a result of the screwy way the heel had picked up the victory at No Way Out, SmackDown General Manager Teddy Long would come out to the ring on the following episode of The Blue Brand to announce it would now be a triple threat match for the World Heavyweight title at the big show, with Mysterio once again being included in this. Before we could get there though, the Road to WrestleMania tour would see the company take a trip over to New Zealand on March 4th, where the local fans got to see many of the big stars in action. Then once these performers had returned stateside, it would be time for the annual Hall of Fame, as this year on April 1st, big time names such as Bret Hart, Mean Gene Okerlund, and of course, Eddie Guerrero would be inducted. Following that, the very next night, WrestleMania 22 would finally take place, with this one quite literally starting off big when Kane and The Big Show successfully defended their World Tag Team titles against Carlito and Chris Masters. 
And things would only get better from here, too, as after this, the second annual Money in the Bank ladder match would take place and would feature Bobby Lashley, Shelton Benjamin, Ric Flair, Matt Hardy, Finley, and eventual winner, Rob Van Dam. So, with RVD now having a title shot to cash in at a time of his choosing, he'd be watching carefully as the two world title matches took place later that evening. Before we get there, though, Mickey James would beat Trish Stratus for the women's title in one of the best women's bouts WWE had ever seen at the time. Edge would give Mick Foley his WrestleMania moment when, during their insane hardcore match, he'd spear him through a flaming table. And The Undertaker would take his streak to 14-0 when he defeated Mark Henry in a casket match. But even those bouts didn't represent the high watermark of the show, because following these, Shawn Michaels would go one-on-one -on -one with Vince McMahon himself in a bout which saw the two absolutely brutalize each other, and at one point, HBK even drop a crotch chop. And that wouldn't be the only DX reference of the night either, because during Triple H's WWE title bout with John Cena, he'd hit a crotch chop of his own, something which didn't exactly help in making him a heel to the crowd, who were vocally against the champ. That said, this didn't stop Big Match John from coming out the winner by the end, though, as following the victory, he'd continue on with his reign. But if fans were unhappy with this, they'd at least gotten to witness the emotional highlight of the night not long before this, when Rey Mysterio did Eddie proud by beating both Kurt Angle and Randy Orton to become the World Heavyweight Champion. It's just unfortunate, then, that as a result of Vince McMahon never fully getting behind Ray on account of his size, the title reign which followed would be notorious for being one of the worst booked ever, with the champ often being jobbed out in non-title matches. But at least he didn't have to worry about that happening on pay-per-view quite yet, because on April 30th, it would be Raw that got the next big show, as they hosted Backlash. And this one would perhaps be most memorable for it seeing the Shawn Michaels-Vince McMahon feud continue when the boss and his son Shane literally took on HBK and God in a tag team match. Yes, forget Logan Paul or Bad Bunny, because 2006 saw the biggest celebrity crossover ever when the Almighty themselves, represented here by a spotlight, would partner up with the then Born Again Michaels in one of the most ridiculous moments in WWE history. Elsewhere, though, things would be a lot more serious, as Umaga would make his pay-per-view debut by destroying Ric Flair, all before Trish Stratus was forced to get mean in order to regain her women's title from Mickey James. Then, once that was done, Kane and the Big Show would come to blows in a bout which ultimately ended in a no contest, and Money in the Bank contract holder Rob Van Dam would briefly become Intercontinental Champion when he defeated Shelton Benjamin for the honor. That said, when it came to the WWE title, this would stay around the waist of John Cena once more, as in the main event, he was able to fend off both Triple H and Edge in order to retain. Of course, after the bout, it would technically be the game who was standing tall, as once he hit the champ with a pedigree, he'd drop more DX hints by closing things out with yet another crotch chop. And all these teases would eventually lead to the May 22nd episode of Raw, where, while Shawn Michaels was being outnumbered by the McMahons and their new lackeys, the Spirit Squad, Triple H would hit the ring to help his old friend out, formally reuniting the old stable from there. And Raw would need a big moment like this to get the focus back on them, because the night prior, SmackDown had gone back to pay-per-view for Judgment Day a show which saw Brian Kendrick and Paul London become WWE Tag Team Champions after beating Eminem, The Undertaker regressed to the 90s when he was forced to try and get a good match out of The Great Khali, and Rey Mysterio eke out a successful World Heavyweight title defense over JBL. Of course, that wasn't the most memorable thing which came out of this show, however, as earlier in the night, Booker T had defeated Bobby Lashley to become King of the Ring, an honor which would see him from there morph into King Booker, a character which represented a high point for his WWE career. What was the reason for this? Well, he was frequently able to play up the comedy of it all by adopting a ridiculous English accent and creating a court around himself with the likes of William Regal, Finley, and Queen Charmel. So yes, things were looking bright for both Raw and SmackDown at this point. That said, they would soon find themselves with some new competition for fans' attention as, following the success of the prior year's One Night Stand pay-per-view, WWE announced they were not only doing a second one, but afterwards, they'd be fully reviving ECW as its own brand with its own separate weekly show. And in order to start things off with a bang then, at One Night Stand Round 2, Rob Van Dam announced ahead of time that he would be cashing in his Money in the Bank contract on John Cena. 
Before we get there, though, fans would get a teaser of what was to come when on June 7th, WWE vs. ECW head-to-head -head would take place and would feature the likes of Edge vs. Tommy Dreamer and John Cena vs. Sabu. Then, four days later, the big show itself would happen at the Hammerstein Ballroom in front of a loyal hardcore crowd who were so rabid, it ended up creating one of the best atmospheres ever seen at a WWE-produced show. And this would only serve to make things even more heated than when Rey Mysterio and Sabu went to a no contest over the World Heavyweight title, and Mick Foley went heel and joined forces with his old foes Edge and Lita to defeat Terry Funk, Tommy Dreamer, and Beulah McGillicuddy in six-person tag team action. Of course, this was only table setting for the main event, however, as entering full enemy territory that night, John Cena would come out to the ring for the final match against a crowd so hostile, one now iconic fan sign even read, if Cena wins, we riot. Luckily then, Cena would not win here, because after a well-timed interference spot from Edge at the close of the bout, Rob Van Dam would be able to get the pin to become the new WWE Champion. And as a result of this, on the debut episode of ECW TV just two days later, Paul Heyman would also crown RVD the ECW World Champion as well, making him a double title holder from there. So that would lead into the next big show of the year on June 26th, Vengeance, where despite this being a Raw exclusive show, ECW would be represented when RVD successfully defended the WWE title against Edge. But that wouldn't be the only notable moment of this show, because elsewhere, Umaga would continue his rise by making short work of Eugene, Johnny Nitro would become Intercontinental Champion after beating Shelton Benjamin and Carlito in a triple threat bout, and John Cena and Sabu would go one-on-one -on -one again in an Extreme Rules Lumberjack match. Then, in the actual main event of the night, the DX reunion would take to the ring when Triple H and Shawn Michaels defeated the Spirit Squad in a 5-on-2 handicap match. Of course, for as fun as it was to see the Degenerates back together, it had become clear by then that as a result of HBK having found God and both men now being in their 40s, this was not the same rebel group it had once been during the late 90s. No, this time Degeneration X were far more PG in nature, something which upset many older fans, but which entertained the kids nonetheless. But coming out of Vengeance, WWE had bigger problems to deal with than a section of the fanbase being unhappy with the new direction of Triple H and Shawn Michaels, because after getting busted for smoking weed in his car while traveling to a show with Sabu, Rob Van Dam would be suspended and stripped of both his WWE and ECW world titles. And this meant that, while on the red brand side, Edge would once again become champ after pitting RVD in an impromptu match on the following episode of Raw. On the ECW side, a new champ would quickly have to be crowned in the form of the Big Show. Needless to say then, the decision to have the once renegade promotion be led by Paul White didn't go down well with fans, as this would prove to be symbolic of Paul Heyman's worst fears about the revival, that it would just turn into another watered down WWE product with none of the extreme identity it once had. Still, even if Heyman was listening to fan complaints and agreed with many of them, it was Vince McMahon who was booking the show now, and so, as the weeks went on, ECW would sink further and further into irrelevancy as it basically turned into a trumped-up version of Heat or Velocity. But while the legendary Philly promotion was collapsing fast, at least SmackDown was still going strong, as on July 23rd they'd return to pay-per-view when they put on the Great American Bash, a show which saw Finley and William Regal revive their old feud from WCW, Mr. Kennedy get an early moment to shine when he got a big-time win over a recently returned Batista, and Rey Mysterio's world title run mercifully come to an end when following a heel turn from Chavo Guerrero, King Booker would pin the champ to win the top prize for himself. And that would all lead us to the biggest show of the summer, as a month later on August 20th, SummerSlam would take place and would see all three world titles on the line as the Big Show successfully defended the ECW strap against Sabu, Edge was able to get one over on John Cena to retain the top prize on Raw, and Batista score a disqualification victory over World Heavyweight Champion King Booker. Elsewhere, meanwhile, the Chavo guerrero Rey Mysterio feud would continue with Chavo picking up the initial win, D-Generation X would defeat the McMahons in a tag team match, and Hulk Hogan would return to have his last WWE bout to date when he scored a pinfall victory over Randy Orton. Not that this would worry the legend killer for too long, however, because the very next month at September 17th's Unforgiven, he'd bounce back by scoring a victory over Carlito. 
But this wouldn't be the most notable moment of that show either, because aside from Jeff Hardy making his return to pay-per-view following a spell in TNA, DX beating the McMahons in the Big Show in a Hell in a Cell match, and John Cena regaining the top prize on Raw when he was able to get the better of Edge in a TLC bout, Trish Stratus would retire after beating Lita for the women's title in her final farewell. Yes, after proving so many people wrong about what she was capable of in the ring, Trish had decided to move on to new ventures in her life, feeling like she'd given WWE fans more than enough stratisfaction during her time there. That said, these changing times would not be matched over on SmackDown, because when they returned to pay-per-view on October 8th for No Mercy, the status quo would largely be maintained when Brian Kendrick and Paul London retained their World Tag Team titles in a match against Casey James and Idol Stevens, and King Booker got the better of Bobby Lashley, Batista, and Finley to keep hold of the World Heavyweight title. Not that nothing changed during this show, however, as after Vicky Guerrero had also turned on Rey Mysterio during the weeks leading up to the show, the now former World Heavyweight Champion was able to get some measure of revenge on Chavo Guerrero when he pinned him in a Falls Count Anywhere match. And if that wasn't enough, once this was over, the rise of Mr. Kennedy would continue too when he was able to defeat The Undertaker via disqualification. But while the after effects of this big win would continue to percolate on SmackDown, it would be up to Raw to take the reins next, as on November 5th, they'd host Cyber Sunday, another show which saw matches be voted on by the fans ahead of time. And this would lead to some interesting situations then, such as the newly formed rated RKO, made up as they were of Randy Orton and Edge, getting one over on DX. Lita defeating Mickie James to win the then-vacant women's title, and Ric Flair and Rowdy Roddy Piper turning back the clocks when they briefly became the tag team champions after beating the Spirit Squad. Then in the main event, the world champions of all three brands would clash for the first time, with King Booker proving to be the better man here after former husband of Britney Spears, Kevin Federline, got involved and cost Big Match John the win. So in the weeks following this, Federline and Cena would actually go one-on-one -on, -one on Raw, with the rapper even getting the shock victory after Umaga interfered and staked his claim to the WWE title. And that would lead us into the Survivor Series on November 26th, as there, Cena and Umaga would be on opposite sides of the ring from each other during one of the two five-on-five -five elimination matches. Of course, the second of these would be much more notable in the long run, as it saw CM Punk, someone who had not long before joined the ECW roster, end up being the most over man in the match, forcing DX to even get on the mic and acknowledge this after the fact. But this wouldn't be all that was happening here, as in what turned out to be her retirement bout as well, Lita would lose the women's title to Mickie James. Then, once that was done, not only would Mr. Kennedy defeat The Undertaker in a first blood match, but Batista would finally dethrone King Booker to regain the world title he never actually lost. That said, for as big of a month as this had turned out to be for Raw and SmackDown, the following month would prove to be disastrous for the third brand, because after ECW's December to Dismember on December 3rd, Paul Heyman would end up out of the company after being the fall guy for arguably the worst WWE produced show in history. Why was this one so bad? Well, it was ECW as booked by Vince McMahon, and so this meant that instead of having the Red Hot CM Punk win the world title during the Extreme Elimination Chamber main event, the boss would fall back on his old ways by having Bobby Lashley come out the victor instead and stand as the absolute antithesis of everything the brand had once stood for. Still, at least the show had given fans a chance to see the Hardy Boys reunite to take on Eminem, so it wasn't all bad. That said, this was only a very mild positive, and so, hoping to swiftly move on from the whole thing then, the company would instead start focusing on their final big show of the year on December 17th, Armageddon, after it was done. And this one proved to be notable because it would be all about both beginnings and endings, as well Chris Benoit was getting his own revenge on Chavo Guerrero for the way the cruiserweight had disrespected his family's name, Kane would put his SmackDown feud with MVP to bed when he set him alight during an Inferno match. Then once that was over, The Miz would make an early pay-per-view appearance with a loss to The Boogeyman, The Undertaker would close out his program with Mr. Kennedy when he beat him in a last ride bout, and in the main event, world champions John Cena and Batista would team up to take on King Booka and Finley in a tag team match. But Big Match John couldn't relax after winning this one because he still had Umaga in his rearview mirror to worry about. That said, this eventual showdown wouldn't come about until the following year, as after one more trip to Iraq for a tribute to the troops show, this would mark the end of 2006 for the WWE. 
And while it had been a year of ups and downs, it certainly proved that no matter what, the company was here to stay for the foreseeable future, even if the boom period was now a thing of the distant past. Of course, this security would be tested to its limits the following year though, because it was in 2007 that arguably the darkest moment in the company's history briefly threatened to sink the entire industry. But we'll get there soon enough.